you know, because my point in putting that out there is that we love people who 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 push the the people at the top to do better and to raise standards. And I don't want Brad Klein or Joe Passoff or anybody who writes very seriously about the topic to stop doing what they're doing because that's been a part of what's made courses better and made courses look within and go, are we really doing the best we can for our golfers? Um, so I love that. We want we want that intellectual side of the game, but boy, it can be off putting. It can it can really turn people off, and we have to keep in mind that a lot of golfers out there don't want to invest the time and do deep dives into these reads and uh and and become miles talking about the you know the sousson of uh the dom cheese or whatever it was jeff thanks so much for jumping on how you doing i'm Great doing to well see you. uh good to see you uh good to be seen and uh it's an exciting time uh, right now in the game well it's an exciting time for golf books i would say because we're here to talk about jeff shackleford's golf architecture for normal people otherwise uh, or how to make you abnormal well because once you read this book you'll be you'll be amongst <laughs> the uh <laughs> amongst amongst you could be amongst the gca weirdos uh oh. of which i hope to consider myself uh a, a card carrying <laughs> member it's all good um no but it's it's a wonderful book and tell me about where the concept where it comes from um you know the inspiration and idea for doing it a lot of it really was started with just all the excitement and interest in course design right now and uh, we certainly have had uh, times in my my life where people have not really thought much of it or thought it's very interesting and that's always been a mystery to me Tom because um, uh, people travel all over the world to play courses and it's not like tennis every course is different and then people have very strong views of them and, and when you flesh them out a little bit you find out they really are based usually in uh, things like I guess course ranking or rating mm -hmm. or slope and um, and then increasingly, as more people have become interested in recent years, I've, I've just heard sort of the question of uh, what, what, where can I read about it a little bit more? What can I, what can I learn? And I did a book about 20 years ago, a primer, and, and it was too long, uh, and it, it was probably a little too serious. And so I thought it was time to do something a little shorter and a little more uh, whimsical and kind of build on, on the momentum of everything that's going on from – uh, I mean, you name it, drone photography, uh, all these restorations and people seeing them on a tournament stage uh, with uh, an obvious difference in the way the, the stage uh, embellishes the tournament. And they people somehow kind of compute, oh, yeah, that's the architecture. Uh, <laughs> books like what you're doing and just, just all the little things that have kind of fed this, this moment. And I thought it'd be fun to, to add uh, to it and uh, throw in yeah i've been kind of using the the parameters that i lay out in the book the three mm -hmm. uh for quite a while and i thought well you know maybe that's a that's a kind of a, a good uh uh <laughs> a good way to look at courses and and a little bit uh, certainly a lot different than what the rankings are doing right now which are still still very uh focused on on uh an elite 100 courses Right. Um, very fun book. Very. And as you said, sh uh, short, easily digestible uh, right here. I mean, and it gets right to the heart of it. Uh, it gives you uh, a way to sort of think about golf courses, look at golf courses and, uh, you know, just congratulations. It's wonderful. I really, Thank really you. enjoyed it. And I think you're right. It is. It's a great book for the moment. Now, this moment is. Um, how do you feel about golf? I do want to get into those parameters, you know, that you discuss in the book about how to talk about golf architecture. How do you feel about golf architecture now sort of becoming this sort of GCA world, becoming its own sort of pastime within the pastime almost where, um, you know, people are, as you say, reaching out and I get those emails too. say, what should I read? You know, I want to get into this and then they do get into us and, and into it. And it's a rabbit hole that you can go down, um, you can really, really go down it, and and somewhere yeah. down there they'll find they'll probably find you because you've been doing this for a while, right? Now, how do you feel about 
uh, now the world is kind of, are they kind of coming to you and what you've been doing? It's, it's, um, is it cool? Is it crowded? Is it, um, is it a little bit, um, obnoxious at times? I don't no. know. No, I mean, sometimes you'll hear some, some conversation and, and roll your eyes a little bit, <laughs> but, mm -hmm. uh, no, I think it's phenomenal. I mean, this, when I started doing writing about course design, obviously it was just a, a, a passion. I was one of those weird kids that, uh, drew holes in, in, in my notebook in class, even kind of before I really got serious about the game. And, um, uh, so when I've done these books and worked on the things I've worked on, it's always been with a, a hope that more people are interested in this because from a young age, it's just been a mystery to me. Why wouldn't you want to know more about the courses, either if you're going on a trip or the ones you play and, and be able to have a, 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 a way to look at them and enjoy them more, even when your game stinks and, and the game can be so cruel at times that I've always thought architecture is just a, a great uh, thing to be a connoisseur of and, uh, and, it, and it's just always been a mystery to me. So many people in golf, you'll you'll have a conversation with them, and they're passionate about uh, you know, cars, wines, cigars, uh, uh, movies, music. You always dig a little, and you find there are these these incredible passions, and they'll go, ah, but architecture, yeah, I, I just not really that into that, or I, I don't, I don't, it looks, it seems too complicated. And I, the more I heard that, the more I realized, well, that's a little bit of a of a, an indictment of probably the way it's been covered over the years. Um, and again, things are changing. There are people who are bringing a little different voice to it, a uh, different attitude. And, you know, again, you and uh, you've got the fried egg out there and you've got drones now, which I write a little bit about in the book of definitely uh, spark something in people. And, and they, they, they just, you know, they see something about a golf course or, Maybe they've just realized, wow, there's a lot that goes into this, and wow, aren't they beautiful, and aren't they interesting? And and especially when you can see a, a transformation of one. Uh, so I love it. No, I think it's fantastic. Uh, I think that uh, if you're a golfer, you should absolutely be into golf course design, and uh, you don't have to go down the rabbit hole <laughs> You know, you're talking about and, and be arguing about what Doak did on the routing. Why did he why did he have a dog leg right after the another dog leg right? You know, okay, well that gets a little a little right. scary. But again, I love that I love that people are debating it and uh, and that's yeah, you know, in the book later on I get into ways to kind of bolster your your cases and how to how to how to sort of feel out somebody who's kind of a BSer and, and yeah. cause it should be fun. I mean, you should have fun conversations and debates uh, about this. It's, it's, uh, it's part of the privilege of being a golfer. Absolutely. It's a great primer. It's, and it's great for someone. If you do know golf course architecture, it's, it's useful as well and enjoyable because I think there's a tone in the book that is, is somewhat self-deprecating. Like you do sort of like have fun with the idea of being an expert on golf course architecture and what that leads to. And in one point in the book that I really uh, enjoyed was when you talked about going full miles. Um, tell us about what, <laughs> tell us about what going full miles is. It's a great, cause it's a great reference. Well, you know, we writers love generally love sideways because it's about a frustrated novelist and, uh, but he's a wine. <laughs> is it an uh, onophile? I believe is how you pronounce it. And he's just a I'll go with lunatic that, yeah. is, we know he sabotaged the one stupid line. Not stupid. It's a funny line, but uh, one silly line pretty much sabotaged the Merlot uh, for at least a decade. And 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 it was uh, you know uh, Paul Giamatti's character. And um, you know you just watch and you listen to wine talk, and now you hear it in beer too, which always makes me giggle. Um, but it's fine, you know, because my point in putting that out there is that. We love people who, who, who push the, the people at the top to do better and to raise standards. And I don't want Brad Klein or Joe Passoff or anybody who writes very seriously about the topic to stop doing what they're doing because that's been a part of what's made courses better and made courses look within and go, are we really – doing the best we can for our golfers um so i love that we want we want that intellectual side of the game but boy it can be off-putting it can it can really turn people off and we have to keep in mind that a lot of 
golfers out there don't want to invest the time and do deep dives into these reads and uh, and and become Miles talking about the you know the Susan of uh, <laughs> Dom Cheese or whatever it was. Now I've forgotten, but yeah. the, the the faint <laughs> trace of strawberry and all that and. Um, you know, I, but I love, again, I love that there are people pushing, uh, those at the top. And, and as you say, I do hope the book is, uh, of interest to those, those serious thinkers too, because I do, I do feel like we still have a ways to go with courses being just, we still just got to drive home the fun idea. Mm -hmm. And I do feel like a lot of the architects still, uh, don't let the player win enough that that and i guess that's a that's a i'm not saying they should make courses a lot easier but you would love to see more architecture that rewards a good shot that encourages a fun shot that you can feed in and different things that yeah that let the golfer conquer the the, the game a little bit more often where we still overbuild and overdo it with courses can you walk us through that? I I want to again get to like the heart. The heart of the book is helping people understand, give give them the language, and sort of the understanding um, and understanding for architecture, how to evaluate it, how to know what they like, and talk about what they like, and things like that. But I am interested in that idea of it, just sort of tracing architecture, maybe architecture in America, going from you know the golden age to this the sort of penal and then the sort of garden age and like. And where I think where we're getting back to now, at least if you look at you know Cor Crenshaw and David Kidd and and, Doug, and, and, the, and 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 you know playability and fun being being a bigger factor now, um, in 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 a lot of golf courses that are being built. But that you know forty years ago, thirty years ago, twenty years ago, that might not have been the case. Can you kind of walk people through how that happened and trace that? Well, it, it is a it is an interesting notion of what what sort of broke uh us from that that heart is good mentality which is again it's still out there we'd still love to <laughs> to see that change but um yeah we we the game has really at least in america been very easily influenced by the strangest little uh changes uh, whether they're societal cultural and yeah I, i've always been fascinated by what happened because uh, if you look at the architects of the 20s my guy george thomas and um alistair mckenzie they thought they were just at the beginning of of really doing unique special cool whatever the word is uh architecture and that it would go to a whole nother level the depression came along wars uh and then there was a mindset that a golf course had to be this thing that kept you in line and kept you in check and beat you up and robert trent jones kind of made a career off of that and dick wilson a little bit and there's some element that, you know, the, the Roaring Twenties got us into a mess uh, thing and we have to do things differently. I think there were elements of that. Handicapping, um, pro golf getting on television, and uh, for whatever reason, there's always been a, a subset of golfers who want to see pros struggle and be beat up like them, a mentality I've, I've never gotten. Um, so there have been all these strange little things that – have have really inspired what architects do and then obviously the the thing that was is by far the worst influence um and and you've done this with your books tom i mean one of the things with a book you hope somebody steps back a little and tries to do something more than you do in a magazine article and so i really tried to kind of step back and read some of the old books and you know they're really not interested in what grew the game or fueled the game at the beginning um based on the courses they're more interested in which royal inspired people and i get all that and that there's certainly something to that but i was really interested in what about the old weird old golf courses made people like this game and make it survive versus uh other sports that 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 golf was based on that died and so i do a little of that in in the in the book and the thing though that you keep coming back to is um there had to be something about it that was fun. And uh, so the thing that really, though, that you realize we got away from that was was the Golf Digest ranking started as the 200 toughest courses. And um, <laughs> they kept the category until the most recent ranking of resistance to scoring. And, and that really drove so many designs and developments. And so for about a, you know, 30, 40 uh, year arc, uh, 
that was a driving force in, in certain developers' minds. They want to be ranked. They want to be rewarded. And, um, and it just did horrible, horrible damage because uh, a court, that should just should not be a, a tenet of a good golf course, in my view. It should be something that makes you want to come back to play and that lets you win sometimes, and that's fun. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, it, I, it'd be, I, I always try to come up with the right analogy. I still have it. But essentially, you know, you don't, you don't judge a film by how hard it was to sit through. Um, you, 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 there are other elements that are much more important to sort of the timeliness, timelessness of the film. And Indeed. Um, so, yeah, that was the thing that I really took away was sort of the damage done by – by that single category in the in the ranking and you know finally it's gone but um and and again there's just so many great things going on right now that that are making uh and it's just a generational shift too there's just people who did who didn't grow up at that in that time when mm -hmm. par needed to be protected like it was this sacred thing uh there are people who are newer to the game and they're playing the game because they want to have fun and they can't yeah. even fathom why somebody would build a course that sends you home miserable and wanting to quit <laughs> it's fascinating really the things and, and i like how you, you frame that in terms of just things that go on in the culture that end up influencing you know that influence art literature and golf course architecture is not immune from that for sure nope. i mean um i mean god color television had a huge impact on right on, on right. golf courses uh people saw you know the masters in color and said oh we need we need <laughs> You need flowers yeah, and gardens. They still you know? do. Yeah. yeah, they still do. You're absolutely still do. So um, that is that is uh, really interesting. And and now to get back and get to a point where, um, you know, when you have those shifts and things are moving around, at some point it comes around back around to where you'd say, okay, found what's the foundation? And the foundation would be, you know, something classic. You know, a lot of the golf courses, you know, you go back to the old in, in your book and talk about the old, and that is certainly – North Barrick and the older and Prestwick, they're foundational kind of courses um, that you would say, yeah, definitely are influencing the dokes and the in the hands and the bill cores and all that. So, um, yeah, so a good a good is a good day in golf course architecture. And you can better understand it via your book. Tell us about the red system because I think this is just really <laughs> handy. I mean, there's something very practical. Yeah that by by reading this that if you're saying i'm kind of interested I, I i like i know why what courses i like but i'm not quite sure why why i like them um you know when i talk creative writing for years it was it was that's what i wanted students to leave class with you know whether writing aside but just the language to speak about what good writing actually is so you can have that conversation because it's hard it's hard to look at a painting yeah. and tell anyone why you like it you know it's pretty yeah. right so so i like that you've developed a sort of um a language here uh to talk about what makes a golf uh, a golf course good uh and so break that down for folks yeah i'm not a fan of systems generally but uh the rankings have gotten uh, uh a little bit convoluted and uh they they're trying to identify the right things but it's it's a little overwhelming and um so for a long time i just uh i i began to really warm to the question of of memorability uh i had been kind of at a uh, i guess there was just a, a point where that was viewed as sort of a shallow notion um but then you, you start to realize especially as you get a little older and your memory isn't as good that uh it, it says so much about a course in so many different ways uh when you can remember them and i started to not be able to remember holes you know within an hour after having played a course and uh realized that uh i could still remember every hole and a lot of details about magnificent courses and started to <laughs> assume that was not a good sign and it speaks to a lot of different things the the and i get it, i explain all that and um, the more detailed elements of design that are are interesting, and there are so many components that have to come together to make a course uh, work and and survive and be fun. And so, uh, so yeah, so so re R is for remember, and that touches on a, a few uh, several different things. And the everyday question is is kind of a it's an interesting one because I hear. Yeah, I eavesdrop on uh, 19th hole type conversations all the time and always have. And, and that's always a fun 
a topic for people to debate. It's, it's, there's two different questions I go with. Is this just, is this a place you could play every day and enjoy it? And then there's the bucket list question of, you know, what's the one course you would want to play every day, the rest of your life. And they're, they're two very different things. And I just think that when you ask that question, it says a lot about, um, a course the, the, the question of just, could you play it every day and enjoy it? And, um, because a lot of courses fail that question. You go, no, I don't, mm-hmm. I don't need to do that again. That was too much. That, yeah. that wore me out. And, and, but then that makes you, you know, dig into some other elements. And, um, and then the, the, the so that's the E and, and then the, the D is sort of a thing that came along later. Um, and I, I apologize, you know, to all the cat people out there who don't like dogs, but, uh, you know, I, as, as from a young age, I always wanted to bring my dog to the golf course. Cause I just knew how he'd love it. I mean, he was a, bearded collie so he was from scotland so uh but you couldn't do that you still can't at most courses but uh i you know i saw a, a dog enjoying a certain course uh in in chicago area and and it was uh, kind of eye-opening because i had just been at, at the u.s open at aaron hills and i and i thought that dog would not be doing that he wouldn't enjoy this place is too big you know aaron hills is just huge uh, and this and it starts you know kind of hitting on the point of scale um and so i kind of went into a whole bunch of research on dogs and what what is it they love about grass and why do they kind of walk and sniff the way they do and i started realizing wow the best courses are you know you'll hear it uh uh tour players always say oh it feels like it's always been there well that that's really their way of saying it's a nice walk um Mm -hmm. because so many modern courses don't feel like they've always been there they're overbuilt and especially stuff from the 70s and 80s so uh so the dog thing goes into a lot of different elements that are kind of intangibles that the other two questions don't address but you know essentially would you want to take your dog for a walk at a place and i think a quiet natural beauty that's that's a that's um that's just a nice flowing walk and uh, it, it just speaks to a lot of things we most golfers love and something that's overbuilt and kind of nuts and um has a lot of rattlesnakes and concrete crossings and you know it's just not a walk and walk the dog kind of place um some people will get that question and some people might struggle with it but i, I did my best to uh, to try to share some things about about dogs and uh, what they love. And I learned some fun stuff from a uh, um, couple of great books, which are mentioned in there. And, and so that's generally the idea. And again, I don't, I don't really like a system, but I feel like those three questions could tell you a lot, whether you like a course or not. Yeah. And then if you want to go a little deeper, you, you, you know, you can explain to people what those things speak to. Absolutely. No, I really, I, I love it. It's it, yeah. It's not a system so much as it's, it's here's questions that you can have in mind as you try to, um, understand if you like a course and why you like that course. I, I not, the dog part is probably to me was the most fun one. And kudos to you. I, I mean, you do actual. You list the dog books. You did your dog research. So uh, <laughs> that's fantastic. I love when golf takes us off on tangents that we didn't that we didn't expect. Um, and and so that's really cool. And it makes me think like last week I was at Aquanic and I'm like, man, this is a dog. Co- this would be such a great dog course. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, any, I think like any Walter, Tra- Walter Travis must've had dogs. He they're like, really they're, they're good walks. <laughs> they're all really good walks yeah. as are as, yeah. as is like, you know, a lot of the golden age courses that um, just were a little, a little more intimate. Um, and so well, give uh, you that just, doggy feeling on that. And on that point, I, I think, the the biggest change for me the book sort of forced me to do is uh being sort of this purist i was uh, uh too turned off at times by how much panelists i knew were caught up in the experience of a place and um and i i, I just realized there's, you can't fight that uh and maybe you shouldn't because you know the, a golf course um uh, yeah, if they're not welcoming, uh, it doesn't make you feel good. You're uncomfortable there, um, and you don't enjoy the day. Well, I mean, it's just part, it is part. You can't you can't mm-hmm. divorce that from 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 the idea of playing around a golf and whether you want to come back there or not. And so that was one thing in the book that part of the dog the dog element was part of it, and just 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 realizing that you 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 just can't. Um, 
separate the two things uh, uh, experience from the the actual just the pure design from the first tee to the 18th green uh there's no there's no use in in resisting it and that was so that was a big thing for me to cave on um in the book because i was one of those people like oh stop judging it by the comfort stations and how the right. you know how the guys in the shop were to you and all that um because it is kind of yeah, when you think about it, the great places in the game, you don't hear very often of a great place in the game where, well, okay, you hear a few, but where 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 people went there and went, oh, great course, horrible, everything else, everything right. else was yeah. just awful, but boy, the course was good. Yeah, yeah, usually it is sort of a package deal. Um, so uh, yeah. some of the some of the the purists may not like that I. I say, look, you, you, you just have to you have to accept that that's part of the evaluation. I tend to agree, Jeff, and I, but I I'm upfront about it when I ever I dip my toe into these waters and say, hey, there are better qualified people to break down shot values and to go into the nitty gritty on every architectural detail, and I'm going to look at this holistically as to like how eager would I be to come back to that property. And and sometimes yeah. it's the architecture, and sometimes it's the, it's the soup. Um, you know. So. But it's pretty rare. I bet. I bet. I bet you can't name too many where, uh, where the architecture was. No. Uh, no. It was, Architecture's got to be good. Yeah. That's that's. Are are, are, yeah. are are good enough? Uh, yeah. Or I bet there weren't too many that were really hard. You go. Uh, oh yeah, I'm just dying to go back there because the people are so great. Like eh, yeah, yeah. I, I don't need to play that course again. So it's just. I, and you know when you think about a golf course, the way people approach them now is the development. It's almost like, a, well, I mean, it could be any number of things in other parts of the world. But um, yeah, I guess maybe one example would be a hotel, a great hotel, and a, and a great hotel is more than the rooms. It's everything. It's the mm -hmm. whole package: the dining, the the arrival, the uh, the way it puts you in a certain mood, and the, the things you can do there. And yeah, you know, and a golf course is more than just those those 18 holes and uh anyway so we'll see how the how how that goes over with the with the purists i liked it um i'm in i'm definitely down on dog so just revisiting r for a second so remember and memorability when i was yeah. reading that chapter i thought for a second um okay the first time i played the old course you know i was 20 years old um not a not you know would have seen it maybe on tv one a couple times and wouldn't be uh wouldn't have that much golf history bouncing around in my head at that time um and i probably wouldn't have remembered beyond the first set between 1 17 and 18 i would have struggled to remember holes well maybe the part oh, yeah. three, you know when you get so yeah it's tough so uh how do we how do we um reconcile memorability when it comes to when it comes to the like a course like the old yeah it is a tough one it's the one that pushes it the most um be, but i'm i'm still confident right after you play it you can remember them all i i think but no there's no question that it uh has some moments you know the because you do hear and, uh, like from people who say like oh you do yeah four five <laughs> six seven yeah, which yeah. which hole was that you know what i mean yeah I get it. No, and yeah. hey, you know what? If you ding it for that, I I can't uh, disagree. It it is, but um, I would also, I guess the, you know, this really gets to where architecture also got in a uh, in a lot of trouble was trying so hard to make uh, every hole memorable that you could go too far that way where it all mm -hmm. is a blur because it's it's like one a movie with just nonstop car chases and like why. You just can't even remember which car chase was really cool, whereas like Bullet, to really date myself here, you know, has just one big car chase. Of course, the rest of the movie's <laughs> just okay, but the car chase is unbelievable and it stands out. So, um, I certainly, I would not, I just wouldn't disagree with somebody who says that. Other than if you do, if you're somehow lucky enough to get to play it more than once. Uh, gosh, it just it just grows and grows, and you want to play it again and again. And to me, that ultimately sort of uh, uh, over over um, well, it it supersedes any of the the memorability questions because of of the uh, the enjoyment and the allure factor and the way it sucks you in to want to just just keep trying to figure it out. What does the old course have to teach us from a golf course architecture point of view? 
Well, uh, uh, gosh, any number of things. I mean, one, that, that uh, contours uh, are just such great hazards. Mm. And, and we probably get a little carried away with, with things that photograph well. And, um, you know, that was another thing kind of doing this book. I realized so many of the, the, the holes you really enjoy playing over and over again, it's, it's just they have just that one thing, that one little annoying thing that you know you've got to be in a certain spot to avoid or you just can't flirt with it, uh, you know, and it may just be the way the green's angled. It, it, the subtle, the little stuff uh, is ultimately what makes a round more satisfying, especially, again, if the architect lets you win. And the old course, as cruel as the contours could be there, they can also be amazingly helpful at, at letting you funnel a ball uh, somewhere if you know what you're doing or you have a good caddy that, that knows the place well and you tells you to play it on a certain line. So they kind of uh, give and take that way. The the And they're all, of course, amazingly random. And I think that would be the other thing that it really teaches uh, that it's – yeah, this guy Max Baer, who I just – I loved his writings, but they're intense. And he and McKenzie would um, get into these fights over the old course – and he was obsessed with this idea of natural versus uh, artificial, and and he and he just wrote some mind-boggling stuff that's just brilliant. But really, the gist is, if it's natural, we we accept it, even in, no matter how quirky it is. Golfers accept it. If it's fake, if you if you know somebody was there engineering it to screw with you, golfers resist it, and so the. I think that's part of the appeal of sort of the the minimalist uh, movement or whatever you want to call it now is that um, there's just a lot less stuff that's artificial feeling and so even when your your gills and your Tom Dokes do something a little quirky if it if it was sort of what was there mm -hmm. uh, people embrace it. Uh, yeah. eventually they just you just go well that was what was there and think oh okay and it's it's a and the old course I think um, People know that those contours were there. They were shaped by the ocean. And, uh, you know, the only thing, you know, a couple greens are man-made, obviously, the uh, 18th, 17th, and the 11th. And uh, uh, people know that, but somehow they, they don't hold it against it. Uh, well, the, old, the road hole, maybe they do. <laughs> uh, so natural versus artificial. It's a, it's a, it's a very layered uh, complex thing if you want to go down a rat hole but it yeah. but it um and i'd love i'd love somebody to do more of a study of of um of why that is and and um but it makes sense too you know uh, there, there's something in, in our egos that really takes offense when you and i think it's why tour pros hated pete die so much because they knew he was trying to screw with them right and um well you so have a I good get why they they uh, resisted his courses you have a good line in the book that I wrote down uh, when we are immediately. This is in reference, I believe, to um, to drainage basins or to USGA greens in that section oh, of yeah. the book. Um, when you tell us, you know, that there there's something that we're immediately reminded that someone not named Mother Nature is jacking with our <laughs> score. And yeah. I thought that's a really good point. It's if there's something about like yeah. I'm if I'm playing North Berwick and I'm playing perfection. And you know, the golf hole, not playing that way. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. And uh, <laughs> I'm willing to accept that this hole's kind of preposterous because it's a lot older than I am. Um, that it was still, there. Still, you know, it was there. This is how this is where they found the green site, and so you get to play it, and that's really cool. If someone built that today, you'd say, oh, oh you son of a bitch. Like, you're, you're just messing with yeah. me. So – um, there is that absolutely that notion of if it's natural, it's accepted. If it's man-made, um, we feel like we're being manipulated and played with. Uh, and so, you know, you become, and, and I absolutely feel that that's, you know, at probably at the root of like a lot of love of Lynx golf and that yeah. these courses are just the way that, um, at least the, at least the best, you know, this is just how they, this is just how they found them. And, uh, um, yeah. you know, uh, and so I think I, I think that there's tell us a, the folks a little bit about some of those um, USGA greens drainage basins some of those things you talk about in underfoot that uh, either make a golf course uh, experience special or can take away from it. 
Yeah, I, I, it's, it's, a, it's an intangible thing, but you just do seem to know when you're walking on a place that was either it's natural or it was shaped with care. Um, and uh, you, yeah, you just feel it underfoot. You just know when you're climbing stuff that's, that's kind of overdone uh, for the wrong reasons. And obviously when you see a, 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 a drain cap and a, and a bowl and a bunch of divots around it, then you really know it's fake. Um, and that's, yeah, that's been a thing of mine for a long time. Um, I was very lucky uh, when, uh, when I was 16, my dad joined Riviera and I got to, to play that and sort of absorb it. And then I got to know Ben Crenshaw when they were redoing the work and, I, and, and a couple of the shapers who've gone on to be uh, successful architects, uh, uh, Dave Axelin and Dan Proctor, who did Wild Horse in Nebraska. And, um, and I learned a lot about drainage from them. And they were what they were so impressed with at Riviera's is how they hid all the drainage and used it as this beautiful way of this little swale system through the course instead of these this weird mentality we have and it always seems to be next to a green or right down pete die unfortunately i don't know why he did it right down the middle of all of his fairways um or there are these bowls and a drain at the bottom and you know and you just go well why you know they they showed me how you can move water off to the sides and do what you need to do to drain the course to make it playable and function agronomically and all that but not interfere with the golf uh or and in riviera's case and and the architects who do surface drainage well to embellish it you know donald ross another one um he has a little chapter in his book drainage 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 but he um he he he, it was masked within the design that bit of function um and so it's a big part of of that underfoot feel, but also we know just shots is just, um, it's just offensive when you get one of those and it's got the little white line around it at the bottom. If it's a tournament, yeah. <laughs> it's just like, ah, this is, it's ugly. It, they don't work by the way, too. They're always muddy. I never, I don't understand why we haven't, <laughs> why we haven't abandoned those. And, and, and then in, uh, from a design standpoint, obviously I learned a lot of this from, from working with Gil and Jim Wagner. Uh, it's laziness too. Um, guys sit in an office and they'll just map out the drainage from there and and uh a lot of the time if you go to a site uh mother nature's already figured out a way to drain it and so if you destroy that you better you better put it back or you better put a system in uh and the and the um, the the human approach for some reason is to try to send the water down instead of away from from the play and uh it's a shame because you know those courses. You see them in the late light. You see the little rumples and the little swales, and uh, it all works beautifully if you get a downpour and it gets the water out of play. So there, it's a, it's a, it seems like such a dreary topic, and it probably is. But um, uh, and you know, same thing with the USGA green. It 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 just makes it very hard to shape a green a certain way that that feels uh, natural and feels like it fits the landscape. And that's why Corn Crenshaw don't build usga greens yeah. they dump a big thing of sand and then they shape it the way they want yeah. and that's why they do the best green complexes in the game because it all just it just works it just fits it just sits mm -hmm. on the ground quietly um and there's something to that uh that that we also respond to just features that 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 are not overdone and over propped up and they yeah. just they just have that nice feel and obviously our ball reacts a certain way to those things but it also just gets to that that walk in the park element and uh, so i've been very lucky i guess is what i'm saying to have learned from a lot of interesting minds on that and i tried to share that hopefully in a succinct and fun way <laughs> yeah and i and by the way i've had already had responses from some people like now i know why certain places offend me uh and so that's mm -hmm. exciting to, to already get that feedback uh here just a few days into the book being out Oh, that's phenomenal, and and certainly more coming. And yes, drainage is not the sexiest topic, and it's one that's no. difficult to explain to a a greens committee or whatever. But you know, and you think when you do think about like the great, especially the golden age architects. You know, I grew up on a William Flynn course, and um, you know the way master at drainage, yeah, right. Gosh, the way <laughs> that like you know we all our greens are sloped in a certain way, and um, 
and and just you know the way he was able to move water off the golf course it's never something you saw it's never unless it really rained and, and it's never something you thought about um but you know it it the, the course trained incredibly well um it's it, you know it's just one of those things people don't talk about because you don't see it you only notice it when it doesn't work right um, exactly. <laughs> but it really you know that it, it occupies so much of an architect's time um you know as, as bill Corn just told me i'm sure you you know uh, so much of the work is how to move water when you're yeah. uh, when you're an architect. So um, tell me about uh, there's a concept in the book, quiet beauty that you talk about. And I think that that's something a lot of people understand in their gut, but uh, can't articulate, which you do articulate in the book. Yeah, there's no question that that we're impressed with something that's really visually stunning uh, the first time you're there. Uh, and and I mean, we're all. I think we're all suckers for it, and I I, I totally get it. Uh, but I I was trying to drive more at those places that are fun to play on a on a repeat ba- basis tend to be the ones that are not quite as trying so hard to to wow you with a bunch of special effects. That it's and and uh, and I think one of the things that's been really cool in the restoration movement is uh, people see trees removed, but then all of a sudden there's this one really beautiful tree that stands out now. Um, and, and, it, and, and it just, the, the landscape suddenly all kind of comes together in different ways. And, and that quiet beauty, uh, is accentuated instead of, uh, there's always just a desire to try to kind of throw everything at a, at a hole in a landscape. And, and it usually doesn't play very well or <laughs> really photograph well, or just look nice and like a nice place to just, uh, uh, to hang out. And, and it's also not great for growing grass when, when it's a lot of trees that are thrown at the mm-hmm. landscape. So it's a, it's a combination of things. And it's, it's another one of those things that, um, everybody has a little bit of a different view of, but, but my sense is that, uh, over time that people just come to love a place more when it it um, quietly embellishes the landscape instead of fighting it and uh, I mean Perry Maxwell had a great quote yeah just just way back before I mean before Pete Dye and Mike Strands and some people who really really moved dirt around um, and and I think there's something to people uh, not liking the game who don't know golf when they see some place that's garish, you know, blinding sand and big mounds and overdone. And uh, just in conversations, you just can tell people who don't like the game. That's something they, they see that you're, you're just taking the natural environment and sort of screwing over screwing with it and over watering it and over this, over that. And those places that, that just, just fit into the land, better we know are nicer walks they're nicer to play and uh they also are are valued more in the in the surrounding world and it's again a hard thing to trace but i think we've all heard those conversations from from with people who are hostile to the game Mm -hmm. um and by the way i feel like there there's way less of that and i've got to think that's just kind of where the game's going we're we're still out of love of green we always will but there have definitely been more courses, high-profile places that are a little bit uh, less offensive, and and whether it's their maintenance ideals or the way they're built, and uh, and then of course we have all the other cool things going on where sometimes Muni's shut down on a Sunday and it, it becomes a park, uh, you know, more dog days at some courses, uh, more. Uh, people realizing they can just go have lunch at a at a clubhouse at a public course that they didn't even think they could do you know all those little things are i think they're starting to add up the sport needs to do more of it yeah um and we'll never make malcolm gladwell happy but uh there there is definitely something to uh, uh trying to get past that notion that every place is just uh uh you know, walled off from the, from the world and, and oblivious to the, the natural world or just the everyday, uh, people who, who live nearby. No doubt about it. And, um, 
which is a funny way to transition to a place that I couldn't wait ah. to leave without talking about. <laughs> well, Speaking yeah, of being now, <laughs> then there's there. Then there's then somewhere there's where the U.S. Open <laughs> is going to be this year, which is definitely walled off. <laughs> How did you know which I, what I was going to talk yeah. about? Um, couldn't let you leave without talking about your boy, George Thomas, and uh, who you've written about at length. Um, George Thomas of the Philadelphia School, although, yep. you know, known for... I just want to, you know, trying to tie it back to my hometown. Oh, I get it. Get credit where you can do, uh, where you can, um, even though, you know, known for his California designs, best best known. Um, uh, and, you know, the U.S. Open coming out your way to loss to LACC, uh, where you've had a lot of um, input yourself and, and, and Gil and Jim. And, um, I mean, where to even start? Uh, well, one, just quickly, Philadelphia School – how did yeah. wh- how'd that happen? I'm just curious, the hometown guy. Uh, it's pretty crazy that all these guys were just hanging out, playing golf, and decided to go out and design like uh, a, a, a very high percentage of the great golf courses in America. Yeah, it's wild. Uh, it's crazy. I don't know. I don't know if there's anything that you can. Uh, it could just be a little bit of luck, but uh, obviously they had a. You had a collaborative spirit that was huge with George Crump and Hugh Wilson and and. They all sort of knew each other, and there was a lot of money there at the time. And, and in case of George Thomas, I mean, he never charged for design. He had he had a lot of family money, and uh, but did a lot of great things to to, to give back. And um, he was a part of that scene, and they all uh, they all were obviously of a of a similar mindset that that what they were playing and seeing was not right. And they were exposed to C.B. McDonald, who said, hey, you got to get over and see my buddy uh, Tom Morris over in <laughs> St. Andrews. And Tillingass made the journey. And I, I know I actually found out recently I'd never had any evidence. And uh, Joe Bosch found a, uh, an article about George Thomas and his dad uh, making a trip over there. Uh, it was more about his father. And uh, I went, ah, so he, I, there's, there is the evidence. I, I knew he had gone somehow mm-hmm. because of the things he referenced. And so they made the journey and the pilgrimage and brought back those ideas. And they were just part of that movement that realized, wait, this is a really great sport, but we're, we're making a mess of it here with these chocolate chop mounds and coffin bunkers and crap. And uh, I think it just kind of went from there. And then Pine Valley was sort of this collaborative lab uh where a lot of things went wrong by the way and they learned from that um and and it was a saga I mean, it was a real saga and, and i think it you know ultimately is what uh uh you know drove george crump to a, a very uh, dark place and and uh you know it was the frustration of it he had this grand vision and he also had some dental issues but it was a uh, you know they um uh, it wasn't all um uh, uh, uh an easy path to to where they got and uh so they learned a lot from one another and it's just uh it's wild and then yeah he he moved west uh he he crashed three times in world war one he was over and he and he clearly had some some depression issues he, he wrote about you know i've been here a year now uh he volunteered he spent a lot of his own money to outfit his unit things like that three plane crashes will do it and uh, and no offense to uh, your area, but it's not the best for growing roses. And uh, mm-hmm. that was really why he moved west um, and he wanted better weather and uh, to do his rose hybridizing and playing golf and recuperating. And then he got into deep sea fishing and he was a busy guy in his 58 years. And uh, so but but the roses did were really the main reason he he moved west. It wasn't uh, it wasn't golf. That's interesting. And so, yeah, uh, so LACC, where does that fall in the George Thomas lineup um, uh, in terms of his um, his calendar, his, his uh, timeline? Well, it's uh, essentially his last design. He, he co-designed Stanford with Billy Bell, but he was ailing, so he never went there. Uh, but he worked with him on the, on the design on paper. Um, so it was, it was sort of the culmination of his career. And it was, the, in a lot of ways, the most unusual because Riviera and Bel Air were from scratch. Um, La Cumbre was a remodel. Ojai was from scratch. And that, and that was kind of the progression uh leading up to it and there were some other really good projects of a public course called fox hills and 
Um, so it was different, though, because he was a member there, and there was an existing course that he had helped build when he moved out here. They, Because of his Pine Valley experience, they enlisted him to supervise the construction, and it wasn't very good. It didn't go over too well in the L.A. Open, and George Thomas messed up a setup in the, um, another event, the California State <laughs> Open, which he wrote about uh, in his book. Uh, and and losing control of a whole location because of a Santa Ana win, which yeah they didn't have uh, they didn't have the forecasting, so he <laughs> he couldn't have known. Um, and so uh, he had to uh, convince the club. Uh, yeah, it's it's portrayed another number of different ways, but essentially he had done these great courses, and and his home club looked like crap, and. Um, uh, so he had to redo the course, and he, of course, had Billy Bell, who who was his right-hand man, um, and a big part of, of his transformation to kind of another level. Um, but people were playing golf in the middle of this, and I can't even fathom how they pulled it off because it's, it's pretty wild to redo a course. It's a complicated property, and, and yet he did and put all sorts of cool stuff into it. And uh, so it was really fun for us to – go back and and look at all that and un- try to uncover what we could and uh hopefully it will show off well in the u.s open what are we gonna see so tell us like you know what did you focus on you know because as we're watching the u.s open what kind of things that you brought back uh are we going to notice and can we say oh i heard jeff talk about that or uh or, or that you think are going to have a, an interesting impact on the on the event itself well, you know, like all restorations, bigger greens uh, that had turned into little circles and all the great mm. whole locations are in the corners. We just saw that at Oak Hill. I mean, it was just like a totally new place. And it was so much more interesting day to day because of all that variety. And that was a big thing with George Thomas. He was a big day to day variety guy. He felt like that was the next place that uh, golf courses would go. And they really didn't. We're now starting to see some things where people are, are trying to use some of his ideas. They were on full display in the Walker Cup because it was match play, and they were able to use some of the alternate tees, and, and he actually designated certain hole locations for certain kinds of setups. And uh, and it was nothing more than that. He just thought it just should just be more interesting day to day. The game is better that way, and that was obviously a Lynx influence because inland courses can't be varied. Now, the U.S. Open being stroke play, they're not going to get as – cute with the the like there's not going to be any uh different pars day to day the walker cup you know a couple of holes essentially change par i mean nobody really it's match play nobody put a new number on the card but but um and it was great i mean it just was dreamy the way he had imagined the sort of the dynamics of a match and the 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 change from a morning session and all that stuff and then the actual course playing that role in the match um, not overwhelming the match, but being that third protagonist. And um, so you'll see a little of that in terms of yardage variety and all that. Um, but I, I guess the main thing that, that will uh, be talked about is, is just you're know, in this very urban environment with unbelievable homes, and then you'll see this very rugged Barranca and, and old sycamores. And, and uh, so that was a big part of the project was trying to, that was maintained Bermuda at the bottom. It was manicured. Like you get a better yeah. lie there and <laughs> some of the fairways. <laughs> um, so getting that back to bring back the beauty and the ecosystem and, and the interest of the holes. Uh, and then the bunkers are uh, a big part of the course. And what we tried to do there is uh, you'll see, a, you know, a lot of the restorations, of courses look a little too new, frankly, to me. And uh, so what we did was we took the look of the old bunkers, but said, well, what would these look like if they had evolved well and kept their shapes, which are that sort of eroded edge kind of uh, a vibe to them, almost like a baseball glove. You know, all those Philadelphia guys loved that look, sort of a, a combination of a, of a dune blowout, but, but more maintained and more playable. Mm-hmm. Um, and so they, they, I mean, you look at old Marion photos, they really had some of that going and, um, and, and Pine Valley certainly inspired it just kind of, it's again, a lot of that eroded look. Uh, and so we tried to say, well, what, what would that look that he and Billy Bell did, 
but kind of disappeared pretty quickly after they built them because of the depression and different stuff is what would they look like 80 years later and so gill and jim had developed a way to make thicker lips and um so we took some of the evolution we made them more functional too because they were really hard to get in and out of they had just built up so badly around all sides and just wanted to make them look old and um so we'll see they don't have fancy lining in them there's gonna be some weird lies probably in faces and I'm I'm a little nervous about how the players are going to handle all that, but um, <laughs> but they're going to look great on TV, and they they provide a real contrast. Um, and it's also going to be the white. The last thing is going to be the whitest. That's not white. That's wide with a wide. D. <laughs> wide. Wide. Second. <clears throat> <clears throat> Freudian slip. <laughs> no, go ahead. No, nah, I was trying to. My pronunciation <laughs> was not sharp there. Uh, and there may be a little bit of a <clears throat> Freudian slip there, but it will be the fairways will be very wide, Tom. Yes, uh, yes, at, at, yes. Like people have never seen in a U.S. Open. I, I mean, I, there's no data, but there are going to be two fairways in particular that I believe will be the widest uh, that they've ever played in a U.S. Open. Fifty-six and about seventy-five yards, I think. Wow. But they play they play about twenty-four yards because you've got to be on a certain slot and. If the ball's running, it, it's been very foggy here, uh, so we're hoping it it dries out a little bit more. We had a great winter in terms of rain, but we'd love a little more sun to get it get that ball running because it's a it's a hilly it's a property where the ball can really run, and uh, so I'm excited to see how that plays out. But uh, it's going to screw with the guys' heads a little bit when they see this this width, and they better get out and play some practice rounds and get their 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 lines down. I think that's going to be, and there's just no data. There's no, they know nothing about the course. Uh, right. So totally. That's a fascinating element to it too. Yeah. I mean, how they couldn't have, how many have been out there? Uh, and when we talk about width, you know, they're used to stepping up in a major championship and there is, it's very clear where you have to hit the ball. There's one option right down, yeah. you know? So, uh, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm really, really excited for this one. Give people a hole uh, to watch architecturally now that folks are listening and saying, all right, I'm getting into architecture and uh, I'm going to read golf architecture for normal people. And uh, here's a hole that's uh, kind of cool and uh, that's either going to have a big role in that you think will have a big role in the tournament or has some features where you can say, ah, this is an example of X, Y, and Z. Something for people to look for. Uh, yeah, I would just pay a lot of attention to all the par threes. Um they're all – I think it's the best set of par threes in the world right now. Just uh, if, if you – over the course of four days and if you set them up the right way, the variety of shots you'll you'll see guys hit. And and, and even the pros who can be – can be a little difficult. They, they, they hate hitting the same club every day on a par three or, or on three of the five, if you will. Uh, there's just nothing worse. So hopefully they'll really mix those up. Yeah, the one that's going to stand out. I mean, for us, for Gil and I, I know the ninth we're most proud of because it had become such a one-dimensional hole, and now it could be 50 yards different day to day. It could be a draw, it could be a a, a wedge that you got to get in this one little spot. I mean, I love that kind of day to day thing. It probably won't look as spectacular on TV as it will as it will play. And and I mean, it just played awful most of my life. Whenever I got lucky enough to play there, it was it was just this little you know bowl and couple pins up the middle uh but the hole that everybody will will really seize on i think is the 15th it's a little par three everybody now loves a short par three even the pros uh and they'll they won't like a couple of the long ones but this one was pretty spectacular in the walker cup and uh same thing big kind of 40 50 yard swing and yardages and shot shapes and and they'll use a little front pin uh, play about 80 yards i would guess maybe could be up to 90 one day and that'll just be uh that'll be wild so i guess that would be on saturday or sunday and uh so yeah i mean right. every hole has a story behind it and and they're fascinating but i think the part threes will be the ones that on television really come through and and hopefully you hear that that the guys are taking a little extra time because they're playing pretty radically different day to day yeah i can't wait i cannot wait and it's been a long time coming jeff i mean I, and I wonder if they'll talk about this in the broadcast, but well, or the USJ will want this to even discuss that, you know, that LACC kind of said no to this a couple times. Um, 
there's some history there on that, right? Yeah, yeah, they came very close in 1986. Yeah, uh, and the club. I mean, it depends on who. I got in trouble one time because uh, I, I suggested I used what Frank Hannigan told me, and the club didn't like what what Frank's view was of how it how that went down. So I really, I, I'm just going to say I don't know how it went down because <laughs> right, I really right. don't. Uh, and they ended up at Shinnecock, and all things uh, were were just fine. And uh, and I'm glad in a way. I don't think that version of LA North would have shown very well it was so heavily uh, uh wooded at that point yeah and there were just trees everywhere it was not it was not what it is now and it's um so yeah it's uh it, it, and of course you can see out you know it was very controversial when we did it we opened up a lot of views and a lot of members didn't want to see out into the city and it's just in a spectacular location where you can you can see to Hollywood to downtown on a really clear day. You can see the mountain above Palm Springs. Yeah, um, down to the airport. Uh, it's just really pretty cool when you're out there to have all these views, and people now really enjoy that part of the property. Will there be a Playboy Mansion overhead? Do you think? Oh, well, it's under construction. I'm actually working on my 14th hole right up right now, and. <clears throat> Yeah, the the mansion really slid the last. <laughs> I realize there are men of a certain generation, and they, you know, they get kind of woozy and thinking of half and the mansion and the bunnies and. But boy, those last those last about fifteen years, it got a little little sleazy. I mean, they rented it out every night practically, oh, and and it was kind of musty. And but oh yeah, you'll get. Wait those. a sec. You'll it sounds some. like you've got it a little. Um, on your last visit, your uh, your opinion. <laughs> It sounds like well, I never do. made it to a Playboy Mansion party. I was never invited. But I'm uh, going yeah. off of people who, after Hef died, they did kind of open. Went, yeah, it's really time to freshen things up a little bit. So yeah, it's been under construction or reconstruction for a while. Uh, but y'all know you'll. I think you'll get a mention. I, I uh, you got I'd it. Be yeah, shocked if someone will mention it. I think uh, yeah. Zach Blair. Uh, got his finger bitten by a monkey sticking in his finger. Yeah, so they did have yeah. this, and I don't. Uh, they have had this little uh, little wildlife area where, if you walk down behind the 14th tee, you could see him. Now I don't know why he would have gotten close enough to be bitten. <laughs> yeah, so just, I never. They were not. They were not that uh, friendly. So I didn't. Uh, I never got that close. But uh, I did go wave at him, and yeah, uh, there was there were all sorts of exotic birds. It was a very cool little little thing well just be careful out there folks apologies to zach if that story didn't actually happen but it may i think it did um and everyone yeah, have a great time make that up <laughs> it kind of is right um i believe he would be down there uh, i could see him going and taking a look at the very possible very and possible. sticking a finger through the fence yeah he's a curious guy um jeff this was so fun i'm well i'm just excited for the open and for the u.s open and i'm really excited uh for you in the book i think it's uh it's a great idea it's it's a it's a tremendous resource and it's a nice easy read it's a great dad book you know father's day is coming up and um it's uh when i say when it's a great dad book meaning if your dad's not a big reader um I, this isn't like I, giving him war and peace <laughs> this is giving him one world look yes. at it and say ah oh, all right i can get through that on a sunday afternoon so it's lovely Cool. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. That means a lot coming from you, and I, uh, I, I'm glad to hear that that's how you, you perceived it, because that, that was the goal. <laughs> yeah. No, absolutely. Wish you all the success with it, and love to have you back on sometime. Okay. Thank you, Tom. Thank you.